Hey guys, hope you're all having a great day. So for anybody who is somewhat new to gardening or just hasn't taken much time to look at this in the past, um, you may have heard of USDA growing zones or while you're at a garden center or just looking at plants to potentially buy, you may have seen on the tags that they have zones on them and it might say that the plant can survive in zones five through nine or four through 10 or something like that. Um, and you know, it's actually something really easy to understand, but I do think it's something that a lot of people may not have a lot of knowledge on. So I figured I'd make a nice informational video to help you guys understand what growing zones are. And also, depending on where you live, how they can differ from one another. So what is a growing zone? Uh, according to Wikipedia, a hardiness zone, that's also what they're referred to, um, is a geographic area defined as having a certain range of annual minimum temperature, a factor relevant to the survival of many plants. In other words, it tells you how cold it gets in areas of the United States. Uh, the map is divided into 13 main zones, and each zone is divided into an A and a B section. So, and then here's a little brief history on this, just in case you're interested. Uh, the first attempts to create a geographical hardiness zone system were in 1927 by two researchers at the Arnold Arboretum in Boston. A man by the name of Alfred Rader published the first map in 1927 in Rader's Manual of Cultivated Trees and Shrubs. This map contained eight zones and was based on a survey of plants and their survivability in different regions of the country. The second map was created 11 years later in 1938 by Dr. Donald Wyman, also of the Arnold Arboretum. His map was published in his own book called Hedges, Screens, and Windbreaks. This map used weather data that was collected from the U.S. Weather Bureau from 1895 to 1935. He then updated his map three times in 1951, 1967, and 1971. However, his map eventually became obsolete as the USDA got into the act. In 1960, the USDA published their own map that used data from 450 weather stations around the country. However, since they used different criteria than Wyman, the two maps conflicted. This ultimately led to the USDA's map taking over. By 1990, the USDA had updated their map with data from up to 15,000 weather stations and partnered with the U.S. National Arboretum. Over time, and as more data came in, these maps became more accurate and led to 13 distinguished zones from Alaska all the way down to Puerto Rico. So we talked about what they are, but what is it that they actually give? What is the information that they actually tell you? So the zones tell an area with the average minimum temperature that an area will expect to see in a given year. This means that whatever the coldest temperature an area will see on the coldest day determines what zone they're in. Each zone splits the temperatures into 10 degree sections and can be further broken down into A or B portions. Each A or B portion is broken down into five degree variants, with the A being colder and the B being warmer. The zones start at 1A all the way up in Alaska, where the average extreme minimum temperature is negative 55 to negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and go all the way down to zone 13B in Puerto Rico, where the coldest temperatures will see only about 65 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's quite warm for what I'm used to. So the USDA has a website called the Plant Hardiness uh, Zone Map, which is a great interactive map where you can look at all the United States and all the different zones. Um, any links that I show you today are gonna be linked down below uh, this, the description. So if you wanna further explore any of these or find out your own information, um, then you should be able to find that right below this video. So if you take a look at this website, you can see it shows you a legend, um, which shows from zone 1A to 13B. Um, and for anybody that doesn't live in the United States, um, it shows you the Celsius equivalent. The one thing I just wanted to point out is that all of the temperature differences, so from like an A to B, or just like zone, like let's say five to six, um, they're all in terms of Fahrenheit, in terms of like the 10 degree differences. It's not 10 degrees Celsius, it would be Fahrenheit. Um, but at least it shows you what the temperatures are in Celsius. So if you know, if you're outside of the country and you know um, what the temperatures typically get down to every year, then you can take a look at the Celsius side and that should be able to help you out. But I'm going to close out that legend for now and just take a look a little bit closer. You can see all the different colors here. And uh, the easiest way of doing this is it says find address or place up in that top left. So you can just look at wherever your location is. So for me, I live in Coventry, Rhode Island. So I'm just going to put that in. 
it'll bring you right to that zone. And then um, what you can do is you can see like the colors that are right here. I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so you can see the area a little bit better. But when you're looking at Rhode Island as a whole, because it's a pretty small state, there's not much of a difference um, depending on where you are. So the northern half of the state is going to be in a zone 6A, which means that the coldest temperature that we'll see on any given, given year is in between negative five and negative 10. Where I live, which is somewhere in the middle over here, is a zone 6B, which gets about zero to negative five. So that whole area is still a zone six, but you can see the difference between the A and the B zones, just separated by about five degrees. That's pretty typical. The north, uh, northwestern portion of Rhode Island typically sees a little bit cooler temperatures than what kind of central and southern Rhode Island sees. And then if you're familiar with Newport, down in this area where it's like the Bay Area, uh, they're actually in a zone 7A because they don't typically ever see negatives in that area. Um, so let's say you know, you're know you not too far away. Let's say you're in Boston, Massachusetts. If you live in Boston, you can either search by the town that you live in or also by your zip code if that's easier. Uh, but Boston, if I and sometimes when you look at the search result, you just have to click on it one more time in the area right next to it. So Boston is technically a zone 7A. They kind of have their own warm spot around the city, but if you live like right outside the city, then it's gonna be a zone 6B. And then let's just say one other example. Let's say you live in Houston, Texas. I'll click on that. It'll bring me right here. And you can see Houston is quite a bit warmer than where I'm from. Uh, they're in a zone 9A, meaning their coldest temperatures that they see um, on any given year is typically not any colder than about 20 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And one thing I will mention is this data is provided um, from the 2012 hardiness zone map. That was the most recent update of this map. Um, and actually there was a shift in these zones um, when they were looking at climate data over the course of about a 30 year period. I believe this data is from 1981 to 2010. Um, so they looked at those 30 years, what were the average coldest temperatures, and now that we've already been 10 years past that point, obviously the temperature annually is rising. Uh, so you may not even see as cold temperatures as this now. Um, I'll give you a great example where I live in Rhode Island. Um, in the last 10 years or so, maybe only a third of the years, if that, maybe even a quarter, we've actually seen negative temperatures. Most of the coldest temperatures that we'll see on any given year is actually in the, the low single digits, I would say. We don't typically see anything colder than about one or two degrees here. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, about where the trends are going from this point. Uh, there's a lot of research too to back that up. It's actually something I'm, I'm working on um, in college right now. But uh, that's a pretty, like just quick rundown about how these um, USDA growing zones work. However, notice the fact that they're called USDA growing zones. Um, they were put together by the, U the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, they created this map um, and it was specifically really only meant for the United States. However, gardeners are found all over the world, obviously, um, and they kind of need their own system so that way they can um, understand, you know, or you guys that are watching that aren't from the United States, so you can understand what plants you're able to grow. So I did some research, I dug around, and I saw some sources that I um, gathered some information from, and basically the consensus that I came to is it actually seems like the majority of the world actually uses their own, uh, or uses the United States um, map. They kind of, and that was, it makes sense because the United States was the first country to um, establish their own map. Um, and so a lot of other countries just kind of went with that. So if you take a look at this website, again, all these links will be provided down below. This is by um, a company called House, I guess. That's what the website is called. Um, and this was talking about Europe. So it, it's not as detailed as the USDA map is um, for all the different states, but you can use this here. So it shows you the average annual minimum temperature, shows you in Fahrenheit and Celsius, and it looks like Europe is typically from a zone three to 10, which is pretty similar to the United States actually. If you take a look, here's all of Europe, and then there's all these like smaller maps that zoom in a little bit more. So if you're in the UK, generally you'll see zone eight, meaning that it's not really gonna get colder than about 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, or you can see negative 12 to negative seven degrees Celsius. Other areas, you can see um, Eastern Europe, including like Poland, Ukraine, um, all those countries. Um, and then, you know, you can just go through and see all these different maps. So it may not be as specific, but certainly still gives you a pretty good information or a pretty good idea for um, how warm or cold these areas will typically get. Uh, the other more important thing that I did want to mention that I was a bit confused at at first is Canada. So Canada, from my understanding, actually has two maps. 
they will um, they have a map which is just like the USDA map it follows the same uh, regulations um, and it's kind of just a continuation of the USDA map um, however they also have their own Canadian map which can be kind of confusing so I would say see if it says anything if you're in Canada about the tags um, if it says like USDA growing zones because um, most likely it'll be labeled and actually say USDA growing zones um, but they're not typically like too far from each other. So this map right here, what they've done here is they've included a zone 0A and 0B. And that's because parts of Canada will typically see colder temperatures than parts of the United States. Um, although obviously Alaska can, can still get pretty cold. Uh, however, you can see that it does get pretty warm. So Toronto down here is like a zone like 6. Um, but then if you look on this other link that I have here, this puts Toronto in that blue color at a 5B. So you can see that it's shifted a little bit from there. Um, and you also can see the zones 0, A, and B are really only way up in this area. It's not nearly as cold there. And I believe this is the map that follows um, the USGA growing zones, but I, I could be wrong, so don't take my word for it. Um, but you can see there's some differences between these maps. The colors are going to be different, so that makes it a little bit harder just to distinguish the difference between them. Um, but if you're in Canada, just take a look at the tag and see if it says if it's a USGA growing zone map or if it's using the Canadian growing zones. Um, and then besides that, most of the world still uses the USGA growing zone um, map, I would say, or they follow the same guidelines. Um, but I, this is where I got a lot of my information from on Wikipedia. It goes a little more into it. Um, so you can see the map on here. It shows you all the different zones, um, but it tells you about other areas that you can find them. And one thing I also found pretty interesting was about, um, was about Australia. That was the only other one that was a little bit different. So um, on here it says the USDA hardiness zones are not used in Australia. This is like one country that I know for sure that they really don't use it. Um, and all it really does is Australia is much warmer than the United States. So there's not really any need to have like the zone one, two, three, four, like those zones, because there's just really no parts of Australia that actually get that cold. So what they've done is they've, they've kind of taken the same thing, the same approach, but shifted all the zones down. So it says the zones are defined by steps of five degrees Celsius. Celsius, so it also works in terms of Celsius, not Fahrenheit. Um, then they have zone 1, which is about negative 15 to negative 10 degrees Celsius, um, all the way up to zone 7, which is 15 to 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, and it says they're numerically about 6 lower than the USDA system. So if you live in Australia, you're probably more familiar with this than anybody else, um, but just know that it's going to be different, which makes a lot of sense. A lot of other parts in um, you know, the northern hemisphere are going to have at least somewhere in the range of the zones that the United States has, uh, but that's typically, it works better for more cooler and temperate climates than it does for more like warmer climates. Uh, so it's just something important to consider. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was just talking about the information that they don't give. Because as great as the USDA growing zones are, they do not give you the entire story with if a plant is going to be able to survive and how well it's able to survive. So just a quick list. They obviously provide you the absolute coldest temperature that an area will see, but they don't give you the average temperatures that you'll experience. So some areas are going to be quite cold or much colder as compared to others, just as the average temperature. They also don't give you the amount of precipitation. So, you know, if you live in New England versus living in Arizona, you're going to have to water stuff a lot more in Arizona than you are in New England, just because, uh, you know, one area gets quite a bit more precipitation than the other. The length of the days is really important as well, because uh, that's a that's a really great thing to consider about having full sun versus full shade plants and that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other thing too would be humidity. Some plants really like being in more humid environments. Some plants really don't like humid environments and can suffer from things like powdery mildew. Um, and then the last thing too is, which is I think the most important thing to consider, is how long an area will actually stay cold for. So if you're living in a more desert climate, you could be in a zone six and it could get pretty cold um, and it might drop down to negative five degrees, let's say, on the, on the coldest night. But if you're living in a desert climate, the temperatures tend to uh, shift much more dramatically because there's less humidity in the atmosphere. Um, and so that means that, yeah, it might get down to negative five, but it might only get down to negative five for 20 minutes. And then that could be kind of as the sun is coming up and then it can quickly warm up and then get above into the single digits and then um, the teens again. 
Whereas, let's say you're in New England in a zone 6 where I live, it could stay in the negatives for a better portion of the night before it actually gets warmer again. Um, and so that's going to create a deeper freeze for the plants that are in it. So it's stuff like that that just is important to consider. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're living in a zone 6 in the desert, you might be able to get away with having a zone 7 plant better in that type of environment than maybe where I live where it's much more humid and the temperatures can stay colder for longer. Um, it might be harder to get away with a zone 7 plant if I'm in a zone 6. So just stuff like that to consider. I'd say in the end, uh, you really don't need to worry too much about all those other factors um, when you're looking at the growing zones. Just when you're shopping for perennials specifically, perennials, trees, shrubs, that kind of stuff that's going to come back every year. Just take a look at the growing or the, the tag, see what the growing zones are. If it's in your growing zone, then you should be golden. Um, if let's say something like if I try to grow a tree and it says it grows in zones six through nine, just err on the side of caution and know to maybe put it in a little more protected space because when you're on that last zone, either warmer or cooler, either way, um, it may not survive as well in that zone and you might struggle with it a little more. So definitely, you know, maybe try to get the majority of your plants where it's well within your zone. So if I find something that grows in zones four through eight, I'm perfect being in a zone six because that's like the perfect climate that it wants in terms of temperatures. Um, but anyways, besides that, I hope this video was um, informational. I hope you learned something from it. Uh, I just wanted to spread this information across so that way, you know, if you didn't have a super firm grip on USDA growing zones that you could, you know, have a better understanding from it now. Um, if you have any questions, anything you'd like me to clarify, um, or any other comments whatsoever, uh, feel free to put them in the comment section down below and I'd be happy to answer them for you. Uh, so besides that, I hope you like this video and I'll see you guys in the next one.